Welcome back to Fluid and Electrolytes Part 2. So we're going to pick up where we left off here previously talking about our electrolytes and fluid in the body and how they are going to add to or to be a component of, maybe a manifestation of our pathophysiology. Our next electrolyte is phosphate. Phosphate is found primarily in the bone, but it circulates throughout the intracellular extracellular fluid. It's a buffer that's used in our acid-base regulation. We talked about that in our acid-base conversation, used for muscle contraction, very important because it is needed for that high energy bond, that, that component of ATP. What is ATP? Adenosine triphosphate, right? So we need phosphate in order to make ATP. ATP is necessary to run the vital functions of the body. It's the energy source for the body, so it's the energy for muscle contraction. If we don't have enough phosphate, we won't have enough energy to run our musculature. And one of the musculature areas in the body that's really prone or that's really going to be sensitive to this will be the respiratory musculature. Hypophosphatemia is going to occur primarily in situations where the patient is either not taking it in or is losing too much of it through the GI tract. So look for GI problems here. Also possible that it could be a hyperparathyroidism situation. Remember that parathyroid hormone is what controls calcium release from the bone. So if we have hyperparathyroidism, the patient's going to be releasing too much calcium from the bone. Remember the inverse relationship between calcium and phosphorus. If calcium is high, phosphorus will be low. There could be some impaired neurologic function as a result of having a low phosphate level, but the primary thing we're going to be concerned about here is that there's not enough phosphate available in order to make ATP. Hyperphosphatemia could occur from taking too much in, but very unlikely. More likely what's going to happen to cause a hyperphosphatemia is renal failure. We take it into the diet. It's part of a lot of the foods that we eat, but we can't get rid of it. We can't excrete it because the patient has renal failure. We can see some impaired neurologic function that's occurring in our patient with a high phosphate level, but we're really not all that concerned about a high phosphate level except for what it does to calcium. If phosphorus is high, that means calcium is low. And a low calcium level can lead to life-threatening kind of conditions, such as laryngeal spasms and seizures. Magnesium is an electrolyte that not only is very important for the proper functioning of the heart, it's a major intracellular cation, but it's also going to be necessary for the absorption and the utilization of other electrolytes, a real important mineral that we have or electrolyte that we have in the body. Some of the causes for having a low magnesium level include malnutrition and malabsorption. So in other words, we're not getting it in the diet. It's not being absorbed. It's not being utilized here. And then symptoms will occur a, a variety, wide variety of different things here, but magnesium is relaxant. So think about magnesium as being a relaxant on the body. So if we don't have magnesium, that means the body's going to be kind of hyperactive and we'll have hyperactive reflexes, convulsions, neuromuscular irritability, possibly having dysrhythmias and cardiac dysfunction as well. A high magnesium level, on the other hand, usually is going to be the result of renal failure and will result in, remember, magnesium is a relaxant, so it will result in skeletal muscle weakness, hypotension, respiratory depression, so we're depressing all the symptoms in the body. Other considerations. We have to consider the possibility of what's happening with ADH, antidiuretic hormone, with natriuretic hormones, and also with aldosterone. So this picture here is showing where we get some of these things from. The, intuitary, the posterior pituitary is producing antidiuretic hormone, ADH. We talked about some situations that could be caused by having abnormal levels of ADH, such as diabetes insipidus and SIADH. We also have these things called natriuretic peptides. It's illustrated on your picture here by NP. So those natriuretic peptides are going to be released from the heart when the heart stretches. Now the purpose of the natriuretic peptide is to try to help get rid of fluid. So if we have too much fluid on board, in the body, the posterior pituitary is supposed to notice that and say, hey, let's produce less antidiuretic hormone. Or the heart is going to notice it and say, hey, there's too much fluid on board. I'm being stretched too much. And it's going to produce a natriuretic peptide. And then also we have aldosterone being produced by the adrenal cortex, which is going to stimulate the renin-angiotensin system. 
The Renin angiotensin system is a feedback loop that is going to try to maintain a normal amount of blood pressure in the body. And the kidney is responding. The kidney is the thing that is sensing this and responding to the situation. So the vasculature in the kidney is kind of looking at how much blood pressure is down there and saying, hey, not enough blood pressure, let's kick it up. So it produces renin. Renin then gets converted from angiotensin 1 and then goes back to the lung, which it gets converted to angiotensin 2, and then it has an effect on the patient's blood pressure. Aldosterone is produced by the adrenal glands to help regulate sodium. It's also stimulated by the renin angiotensin system and it tells the kidneys to hang on to fluid. So this is another mechanism by which the body is trying to hang on to fluid if we happen to have a situation where we are dehydrated. So in dehydrated situations, aldosterone is going to be produced to tell the body to hang on to fluid. Now our natriuretic peptides, on the other hand, they're primarily used to try to get rid of fluid in situations where the patient has too much fluid on board. So it's going to stimulate our water and sodium excretion. And again, these are coming from the heart when the heart is being stretched too much. We have two main ones that we're looking at, atrial natriuretic peptide and brain natriuretic peptide. Now, BNP, or brain natriuretic peptide, does not come from the brain. Okay, well, well wouldn't you think so? The name says brain. I mean, come on. But instead, it comes from the heart. So why is it that we call it brain natriuretic peptide? Well, it was first isolated from the brains of animals, and that's where the terminology came from. However, in a human body, BNP comes from the heart, and it's going to be the result of having the heart stretched too much because we have too much blood volume on board. BNP then goes down and tells the kidneys, hey, get rid of some of this fluid. We're being overly stretched up here. So let's take a look at some questions and answer them in relationship to some of the concepts that we've talked about so far. Blank is the dominant anion that helps maintain osmotic balance in the extracellular fluid. And if you said sodium, you are correct. Sodium is the dominant anion that helps maintain osmotic balance in the extracellular fluid. Our next question, if the level of bicarbonate ions increases the level of chloride ions... And if you said decreases, you are correct. If the level of bicarbonate ions increases, the level of chloride ions decreases. That's because chloride and bicarbonate have an inverse relationship. If one rises, the other will then fall. In a post-operative patient who has a chloride imbalance, you would expect to see a change in the electrolyte. So hopefully you said sodium. Yes, sodium and chloride go hand in hand in most situations. If the patient has a low chloride level, what acid-base imbalance then would you expect to see? Hopefully you said metabolic alkalosis, low chloride level, alkalosis, high chloride level, acidosis. A primary cause of hyperkalemia is...
renal failure. Renal failure is the primary cause of hyperkalemia. We're taking potassium in the diet. We can't get it out through the kidneys, and it starts to build up in the body. The most significant effect, then, of serum potassium alterations is... Well, the most significant effect is going to be cardiac dysrhythmias. Certainly, we can have lots of effects of a low or a serum potassium alteration, but the most significant of those would be the patients developing a dysrhythmia of the heart that could lead the patient to developing sudden cardiac death. The primary effect of a sodium regulation is... Hopefully you said water balance, the primary effect of sodium regulation is water balance. Sodium changes in the body in order to change water. Water follows sodium. Which of the following is a common cause of hypokalemia? Yes, and hopefully you said diarrhea. Diarrhea is a common cause of hypokalemia. The patient has diarrhea. We're losing potassium through the diarrhea, and we're not able to replace it. The level starts to drop then. Well, thank you for joining me for fluids and electrolytes. Hopefully you've enjoyed part one and part two of fluids and electrolytes and learned a little bit more about how the fluids and electrolytes work in your patient's bodies. Thanks for joining me this week. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, bye now.